We're back. Uh, this is S.J. Thomason, and today I'm here with Andrew and Joshua, and we're going to talk about victim cultures, Frederick Nietzsche, Jordan Peterson, and more. And uh, it's a Christian chat. We're all Christians. And um, if you were just on the last call, I apologize. My internet went down and uh, completely lost the connection, and I've been scrambling to try to get another connection. So now I'm back. Uh, so I wanted to see where we left off. I think, Joshua, you were chatting when we left off, when I left off, and <laughs> was so rudely uh, shaken off the internet so well, I'm not even sure where I left off I, I do know this I mentioned um, uh, I believe uh, Andrew mentioned uh, pathology and I brought up pathology also because I mentioned in one of my uh, last Twitter posts today that if one such as atheism does not see the patterns in life you know through the regular way we perceive things that some things are good for building character and some things aren't that lead to a path that, 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 that goes to in another direction than leading a wise and virtuous life, then I believe it is the, um, the opposite. I don't, the opposite of schizophrenia. It's some kind of uh, pathology where you refuse based on your pure rationalism, the pure rationality to see what's right in front of you, that there is a way to live. Um, um, and I think to, to, to really come to grips with that philosophically, we can't just say it, it you know, it's, it's somehow platonically exists, but I think we are, as Andrew's really delineated, that we are made in the image of God and we are um, image bearers. Uh, so that's what I had to say. Yeah, I agree with you. What do you think, Andrew? Yeah, definitely. And um, this is sort of the fundamental thing, right? That in order to understand how the world works in a manner that allows us to act, we have to make decisions on how we orient ourselves, right? And, and the way that, that we describe this is usually in spiritual language. What are you orienting your spirit towards? And Jordan Peterson is excellent at this, right? He he talks about how this relates to a hierarchy of goals, and 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 one of his recommendations for people that that in his clinical uh, practice is to pick the ideal, right? Pick a, a a good north star that that that's actually really worthwhile to, and would make the suffering worthwhile that you have to experience in life, and. and th the, the, this gets into what the nature of God is in our relationship to God, right? Because the, in the Christian natural theology understanding, God is the source of intelligibility that uh, the, in, in the beginning uh, the, there was God and the God was the Word and the Word was with God, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And basically that fundamentally the world has meaning and meaning is the fundamental reality not material and and you can of course always act as though meaning is the fundamental reality but but non-theistic or atheistic systems claim that the fundamental reality is material and that meaning emerges out of that material and it sort of gets it backwards um and i think the that that Based, based on the psychology and sociology we see that 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 meaning as the basis of reality is true right because when we act in that way we actually flourish more and that and this is getting into a little bit of a pragmatic definition of truth but but if things connect that way they probably are meant to connect that way that makes sense to me. I, I, I see the universe has meaning and I could say that even if we think about God and consciousness and exactly how the universe began, and we do know it had a beginning, that's one way that Christianity is distinguished from other religions. But um, if we go back to that, we realize there had to be a presence of a consciousness and uh, a meaning and that obviously preceded any materialism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Uh yeah. So. And, and circling this back to victim culture, right? Um, 
it, it, it's not enough to have meaning in the world. You have to have the right meaning. So if you choose the meaning that everyone is either an oppressor or a victim, that's the wrong meaning to choose. And you'll have a bad time, even though it's very simple and, and you know, you can cultivate these these high emotions and, and, and uh, fulfill your passions of vengeance against the enemy and compassion to, to the victim. That, that's not the, the reality we live in. And so by believing that or, or acting and believing in, in this sort of existential sense of orienting your actions towards that is you're having just as bad of a time as someone who's a nihilist in some sense. Yeah, and I think that swings back to Marx, like you mentioned, Karl Marx, and he sort of made it out as if uh, people were the victims, the workers are the victims, and the the and they're the victims of uh, workplaces in which the leaders are basically keeping them down. Just to uh, add one thing, I think, Andrew, I think you um, are articulating very clearly, not just Jordan, uh, Jordan Peterson, but William James, the pragmatist and his uh, principles of psychology. He makes uh, kind of the same or a similar point. Um, I wanted to um, read um, uh, Brad's. I, I will get this in a second. I, pardon me, I, it just escaped me. Um, I have a feeling there are many books in that room. <laughs> and that's based on our previous interactions and all of the books that you've brought up to, to show the, the group here. here it is. I got it right here. Um, Bertrand Russell, the great uh, atheistic philosopher that a lot of our secularist friends like to bring up, he said that we... Um, we need to face the absurdity of life and we need to build a firm. Uh, this is a quote the, we need to build life uh, in existence on the firm foundation of the unyielding despair. That is not a, the, the philosophy of atheism, that is what it leads to when you do not have um, a philosophical anchor, a vantage point that transcends our, our mill cultural milieu and our uh, uh, the mere world of becoming. And if you don't believe that there is a world of being, that hierarchy of values that Andrew alluded to, then you get all this nihilistic and postmodernistic and uh, uh, existentialist language. And really, I, I don't think see how life is worth living um, uh, when you when you get rid of, of God. Uh, the most brilliant atheist, like uh, Dostoevsky, also saw this. He said that if immorality, uh, immortality, if God does not exist, all things are permitted. Nietzsche makes the same point um, in one uh, of his uh, his books, uh, his stories, The Madman. Um, I we see the world not just as Andrew um, delineated not just as the substructure as matter, but as the meaning of matter, what matters. We don't just see the objects, but to see the objects, we, we, we have to see it through a subject way, uh, through a consciousness. Uh, this is what Heidegger was just trying to get across, the phenomenologist, uh, that there is a near infinite um, an uh, amount of possible interpretations when we look at the world, when we look at um, ob objective reality, or so to speak, objective reality, but our perceptions and our lives, and even, uh, dare I say, our history and religion and everything in our past that has gotten us to today helps us see the world in a certain way. And we see the world through meaning and values and this hierarchy of values. So um, when atheists say they don't believe in God, well, they live as if God does exist. Yeah, I, I you know, and it, it brings us back to the idea of objective morality. And, and I think I, I, you brought up some good points there, especially with uh, Bertrand Russell, because I think about how everyone's trying to ground their belief system into something. And so for him, he was grounding it in the idea of pain and saying the humans have a, a joint concern for pain and we all feel pain so um but that's not you know and what i think you're saying is really what 
what we can ground it in is uh, our dimensions such as meaning. So overall, humans also share the commonality in that we all seek a higher purpose. It's actually hardwired within us to seek a higher purpose and meaning for our lives. And so that is one objective grounding that transcends generations. Yeah, and, and uh, touching on, uh, elaborating on this a little bit, the, the other issue is what meaning do we choose, right? So let's assume that uh, as part of a thought experiment that atheism is true, right? That there is no fundamental ultimate reality that is intelligible to the world. What, what ground do we have to choose, say, Bertrand, Bertrand Russell's perspective of despair being the fundamental thing that we fight against versus Nietzsche? who says, well, despair exists, but we're not going to overcome it that way. We're going to, we're going to really try to breed a new race of men that, that can, that can uh, overcome, overcome that, right? And, and to the president, uh, or even the theist, you can choose the goals that you have for yourself and your society and rank them. Uh, but if you don't have a fundamental divine ground for that or ontological ground, it all become equal in a sense, right? Why should we choose Marxism over Nietzsche or uh, or over fascism or, or you know materialist nationalist fascism, right? Uh, and, and that's sort of the other issue is a lot of these young atheists who aren't very philosophically sophisticated basically say, oh, well, it's it's obvious that, you know, we want to minimize pain. But it's not actually obvious that we want to minimize pain unless we have some other ontology that says whether pain is an evil or not. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. And I, I think that I think, in fact, it, let's let's go into that. What would you um, and I'm seeing that someone is in the chat, uh, Darwin's greatest hits and Darwin's greatest hits is saying if God exists, objective morality does not exist, um, which I think we can agree with. <laughs> Um, but what would be an argument that you'd use against relative morality? So a lot of atheists, like you said, actually I would consider them unsophisticated atheists in this case, would get up and say, well, we decided that uh, we wanted to have it this way in our culture, and we decided that stealing is wrong, and we decided that that uh, pain is something that we all share and that we don't like pain. And and so there's there are those atheists who like to make those relative arguments. And I told some guy last night, I said, well, what if I just decided today I'm going to steal your wallet? <laughs> and so who's going to stop me? He said, you know, and so um, what do you yeah. think? Yeah, and, and I think that's a really strong argument is no one acts as though things are relative when it happens to them. You know, it's not like you don't react to having your things stolen in the same way you would react to someone giving you chocolate ice cream instead of vanilla, um, <laughs> even if you really despise chocolate ice cream. And, and then the, the, the other point is this if morality is relative and decided by culture, that means that Gandhi was a bad man. It means that um, uh, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, was a bad man. It means that Socrates was a bad man. It means that anyone who is in the minority moral uh, position is a bad person. And that the, the only thing that, that can be said is those people succeeded in being popular or changing people's minds and that for example uh, Hitler or Stalin that their flaw wasn't that they were evil or had the wrong goals it was that they were ineffective that's an interesting thought that I'm sure would go across very in a controversial way So do you uh-huh. think there's a reasonable argument? Actually, I, I misread what Darwin's greatest hit said. Darwin's greatest hit said, if there is objective morality, then God does not exist. And actually, I disagree with that. I think it's the opposite. But um, but we could certainly chat about that, too. What were you going to say, Joshua? Well, uh, I, I often bring up common sense realism, that Scottish school that so influenced um, Amer- American civil policy, American law, and, and so forth. 
that common sense realism, who I'm referring here, is Thomas Reed. And Thomas Reed, by the way, uh, in this common sense realism school from Scotland, he had something to say about the uh, skepticism of Hume, of David Hume. They were contemporaries there in Scotland. This is what he says, uh, Thomas Reed. We see then that Mr. Hume's philosophy is very much like a hobby horse, uh, wh where a man can use all the time and ride to his delight. But when he tries to bring that hobby horse into the marketplace, his friends would quickly uh, impel a jury and co confiscate his estates and this, um, the solitude over to never leave him alone. You, you see, the problem with David Hume and, and skepticism, and much of these atheists, they, um, they use this kind of skepticism. Um, it's, it doesn't confront lived life. Um, and I think that's the real Achilles heel of a lot of this, um, you know, this skepticism, a lot of these silly arguments. For example, um, you know, well, I'm not going to go into the, the particulars, but live life, um, what Jordan Peterson, what William James, what Dostoevsky, what Frederick Nietzsche, what others uh, have critiqued this pure rationality, this pure rationalism, what Immanuel Kant, Kant uh, critiqued also, it just does not bear on real life, on live life and how we conduct ourselves. I agree. Now, now I see that Craig has joined the chat, so um, let's go ahead and say hi to Craig. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Can. Oh, okay, good, because I was talking on the beach and nobody could hear me. I'm not sure what happened. Um, so what happened? Did we, the other? So we're, we're just chatting about um, what we, we've kind of been veering into atheism and discussing atheism and, and, uh, and some of the ideas from the past with respect to atheism. And we've talked a little bit about victim cultures, kind of the idea that um, a lot of cultures elevate victims and that's not a, a positive move. And then people have brought up some Jordan Peterson and I know how much you like Jordan Peterson. Well, okay, yeah, totally. I, I heard what he was just saying. Um, yeah, Peterson is actually going to be a game changer as far as I'm concerned because uh, um, I'll just throw this out there. If you watch the Sam Harris-Peterson debate, and I've watched it now a few times, 85% of what they talk about they agree on because they've both been educated you know, pretty thoroughly. It's only small areas that they veer off. And the basic premise of Peterson's argument is that religion is extraordinarily useful in helping people, helping society as a whole and individual people, you know, build meaningful lives. That's mainly the core of his argument and it's really irrefutable. Against it aren't very convincing. So that's where I am on that. Um, Carry on. <laughs> Peterson's kind of, he's kind of interesting because he actually, he, he hasn't decided, like he's not, he says he lives like there is a God, but he hasn't confirmed with himself. He said it's going to take him three years before he determines whether Jesus uh, truly resurrected, as he said he did. So I, I find him kind of a fascinating character. He's 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 uh, he's interesting. To right, watch. but that's but that's exactly what makes him so useful is because he's he's approaching it almost entirely from you know what exactly what atheists say they want evidence based reality, and he's at the forefront of you know, basically where, where, where that evidence-based reality is pointing to, you know what I'm saying? So he's really, really useful in that sense, in terms of the core of his arguments. The, he's the argument, he's where he is in terms of his faith is almost exactly where I was prior to me becoming a Christian. I was like, you know, if you ask me different times, depending on what time of like, how I was feeling on a given day, I give you a different answer. You know, sometimes be like, yeah, of course. And other times be like, no, <laughs> he's sort of like that. So, yeah, I agree. Yeah, I was actually just like him too for a while. I, I, I wasn't sure about Jesus being real. I was, that was probably 20 years. <laughs> I was like that. Right. That's, yeah, because that's like, that's something Jesus has to demonstrate to you personally. It's not something that you can believe intellectually. But where he is intellectually, anybody can get to. And it's not atheism. It's in between. It's sort of like, you know, there's something really, really important going on in religion. And it's really, really, really useful as a tool for society and individuals as a whole. 
And it's really powerful. That's why he's becoming intellectually convinced that there's an actual God behind it. Yeah, and and sort of the, the fundamental frame that Jordan Peterson starts with is Dar Darwinism, right? And he basically takes these these premises that that all the the new atheists claim that they affirm, and he brings them brings them home, so to speak. Correct. Exactly. And uh, yeah, go go ahead. No, it, it's a hundred percent. And the uh, stuff that he reads, it, the stuff that he's reading, all kind of points to the conclusions he's coming to, like Nietzsche. Um, I forget what he just mentioned, but it, it's a whole body of like Dostoevsky, Nietzsche, you know, Jung. It's it, it's sort of like an organic conclusion if you examine the evidence, and that's what atheists always say that we. That's what he was doing for fifteen, twenty years in a university, and this is where the evidence is pointing. You know what I'm saying? That's why it's game changing, because there's there's no really good arguments to the contrary, as far as I can tell. Yeah, I'm, I'm, and. Oh, go ahead, Josh. Well, I've I've looked at um, some of these issues too, in what how how religion and specifically Christian theology and Christian philosophy, the interplay of faith and reason, uh, down through the centuries, and how by the year fifteen hundred, and I'm I'm referencing this this new book, uh, S. J. This is Civilization by Neil Ferguson. Um, this is a Stanford historian. He used to be at Harvard. He argues, now this is on page uh, 12. He argues six killer apps made uh, the West uh, superior, or starting to dominate the rest by the year 1500. This is his, uh, his six things. Competition among Western European uh, countries, uh, science, the development of science, how it flourished in the West, uh, and it started in the West and not anywhere else. It started in Western Europe. Uh, property rights, medicine, uh, the consumer society, and the work ethic. Now, I've read uh, lots of other scholars who also add other ones like, like Christian philosophical principles, and I'm here referring to Rodney Stark. So did we decide on what moral principles to live by? Our whole history uh, God revealing things through us, through how we live, through uh, spiritual formation and development, uh, how our laws are based, uh, what, what the laws are based on. All of this history uh, is significant, and we can't ignore it. We ignore it at our own demise. So there is a reason by the year 1500, um, the West started to dominate the rest. And it's because I believe in those applications and the interplay of Christian theology intertwined with all of them. Yeah, and that, that piggy, I could piggyback on that and say that Max Weber pointed the same thing out. You and I have chatted about that before, but he talked about the Protestant work ethic and the spirit of capitalism and what that did to change society in the West and, and how that played a role on, on, a, on industrialization and, and other factors that have helped to increase our economies. Absolutely. Um, I'm, I, I said in a, in a discussion before, I'm not sure if I totally disagree uh, with uh, Max Weber, but if not, it certainly was Christianity that propelled the way you could uh, worship God through the work that you did. So I'm just not sure if, if it was the Protestants that initiated that or if it was Christianity in general before that time. But I think Max Weber makes a very powerful case in that regard, and, and I do agree. Craig and Andrew, we, we, you know, I should probably say we're all coming from different perspectives as far as which sects of Christianity we, we're, we follow. Like I'm actually, I was raised a Catholic and I became a Baptist. Um, what, are you, what are you guys? Who are you asking, me or? I guess all of you, I'll, I'll, uh, Craig, if you wanna say. Um, I don't really know what I'm classified as, uh, uh, sort of a non-denominational, I guess. But, you know, when, when, I, when I use the, the labels to describe myself, it means different things to different people. So I just say generically Christian. <laughs> just, that's it. I practice, you know, very, very idiosyncratic version of Christianity. Let's say that. How about that? <laughs> that sounds fair. Um, I would say that I'm more of a C.S. Lewis type Christian. Um, that believe in the essentials of oh, good answer, you know, good answer. 
I, I, I have views on other things, but not strong views on these secondary doctrines. Um, I, I like to emphasize these, the core doctrines, uh, especially the resurrection of Jesus, which is a, the cornerstone of our society and, and, and that we're made in the image of God. This is what Western civilization was built on. Um, and, and that we're all, you know, all sinful and we all know this um, and the belief in one God. Um, there, there are other things, but I, I like C.S. Lewis, um, like to have a mere Christianity viewpoint. I like that. I, I think that's a, that was a really clever answer. <laughs> yeah, I thought you, you were going to like that. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, I'm also a big fan of C.S. Lewis, but I ended up uh, basically following C.S. Lewis all the way to Anglicanism. Um, so I am also a, a C.S. Lewis style Christian, but I am an Anglican. So um, a traditionalist Anglican specifically. Uh, so uh, I uh, try to do the daily offices. Uh, I do liturgy um, and stuff like that. So yeah, that's what I am is a high Anglican. So now, weren't you? Were any of you raised? I think you were Andrew. weren't you raised a, as an atheist or or you? Oh, uh, so I was raised Lutheran. Um, uh, my family was relatively non-practicing uh, in my childhood, and I was a serious at the time what I would call an agnostic uh, as a young man for, uh, let's say, four or five years. Um, but uh, so I, I had a period where I lacked a belief in God, and uh, by modern definitions, that would have made me an atheist. Interesting. How about how about the other two, Josh and Craig? Um, I was um, like, well, I was. Oh, go ahead. Oh, no, you go ahead, sir. Um, I was raised like technically Catholic, but nobody really cared if I followed the faith, and I wasn't. It, people would have been really surprised if I had. Like it was, we were nominally Catholic, but that meant we went to church on like Christmas and Easter. Practically speaking, I was agnostic and very secular. Um, and then why Peterson, why I started like recognizing what's going on with Peterson is because I went through the same process in my 20s. And for the same reasons, I started reading like the same books, you know, like uh, a lot of Nietzsche, a lot of Jung. And they started put, producing like an intellectual conclusion that God was real. Now, that was prior to me actually becoming a Christian. But it was very similar, very similar to what I hear Jordan Peterson talking about for the same reasons. Um, and then, you know, I had a, a like a, I got, I, I had a, um, an experience when I was, what, 30 out here in California where I became an actual Christian. And that sort of sense that I guess a non-denominational Christian is what you call it, but I'm not really sure how I would classify it. Go ahead. I, uh, became a Christian when I was, uh, 10 years old and, um, was raised uh, a Baptist, been a, a nominal Baptist. I went to different different types of churches. Then at about 19 years old, I rededicated my life and then started reading apologetics and philosophy. And now at the age of 40, I've been reading for quite some time. And, and yes, SJ accumulated a lot of books um, in that time. And um, so that that's what I I, I, I think where, where I'm coming from. I, I do want to say this before we go on. I'm really enjoying this conversation. Um, how about we start uh, the in, the uh, Christians intellectual dark web? Sure. Yeah, go for it. Go <laughs> go for it. Uh, yeah, I would I would love to. Uh, yeah, I think that would be really good. On, There's um, a lot atheists. I, I think we should. I agree. Because it seems like there's a lot of atheist channels and it seems like there's many more atheist channels on YouTube than there are Christian channels that, mm -hmm. that have these kind of discussions. So at least that I've found. I've been looking around oh, for a ton, while now. Tons more. Tons more. Yeah. And they all have a lot of subscribers too. Did you notice that? Like Shannon Q, I'm going to talk to her tomorrow. I'm getting on a, a channel with Shannon Q and Prophet of Zod tomorrow. But Shannon Q started her channel, I think, last August. And she has something like 3,000 <laughs> subscribers already. I mean, it's it's crazy. Wow. Well, yeah, because they're 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 on the they're on the cusp of a popular movement, 
um, there's a lot, there's a strong grassroots atheism that no. built up in the last 10 years, actually. It was, it so, was so, with the four horsemen. So I'll what? disagree with all, uh, you on that. It, it's not actually grassroots. It's fundamentally uh, a paper tiger that the... Oh, yeah. I, that, 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 that's that, not... Sure. Go ahead. That's, that, I, I, don't mean, I don't mean anything. I'm just saying as a, as a cultural phenomenon, um, like the people who I know who now have like 50,000 subscribers, they just started channels and there's a big audience, not big by historical terms or big by, it's, not, it's nothing compared to like the Catholic church, for example, or the Anglican church, but big in terms of, you know, they, right now they have a, it's popular and that has a lot to do with the four horsemen. It, you know, it seeped into the, into the popular culture a little bit over the last 10 or 15 years yeah and it's become kind of a trend that's yeah all. that's yeah all I mean. yeah and, and and i apologize uh i've i've made this sort of a hobby for the last three years sort of investigating this phenomenon um and, and attempting to counter it uh but but uh and um uh, i'll sort of summarize some of the the things me and my friends have, have um uh, found or, or, or analyzed on this is that one of the reason why YouTube uh, channels seem to be so popular and, and uh, is because the really atheists don't really have uh, a way to engage in fellowship with people that they identify with, right? So even as like a non-denominational Christian, you can easily go to a church and right. have, yeah. have a community to engage with. Um, so that's one of the problem uh, problems they're running mm -hmm. into. The other thing is uh, there's a lot more available for like Christian formation, right? We literally have 2,000 years of books and, and tradition that we can look at, everything from C.S. Lewis to Augustine. Um, but but atheists don't, and so part of it is they're trying to discover how to how to do this. Um, and then the, the the other thing is fundamentally a lot of it ends up being sponsored or encouraged mm -hmm. by people who don't like religion, specifically people that have Marxist sympathies. Um, and one of the ways to, to bring about the Mar Marxist utopia is to eliminate uh, religion, especially Christianity, for some reason. Um, and and all of these sort of factors take into uh, play into it, right? And and it's not as much of a popular movement as, as they they might once have have desired right uh, over the past fifth uh, almost 20 years now the the number of people that uh, uh, identify as non-religious has gone up in America from like seven percent to 22 percent but church attendance hasn't changed mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. I mean I I would discusses a lot of this I want to say hi to Eve in the uh, in the sh chat. Also, Dirac, Ra, and Shane, just real quick. GPH. Um, Shane. Say hi. Up, Shane. Shane's <laughs> awesome. Hi, Eve. Um, yeah, I would agree with everything you just said. Um, it's just, and there's probably a ceiling. Um, I think actually Peterson kind of represents a resurgence of religion because he's starting to become really popular really quickly through the same channels, you know, YouTube, things like that. And there'll be YouTubers in his wake, you know, doing makeshift type of a variation on that, that type of apologetics. That'll be really successful, I think. They'll take off. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I, I'd agree with most of what you said. There's, there's a political arm to atheism that's, I, I'm, yeah, I mean, most of what you said I'd agree with, for sure. Jordan Peterson is is unique because you know he just started that started in 2016. I don't know if he he hasn't been that famous for a very long time. It's it's uh yeah. he went up against one of the bills I guess it was in Canada and made a name for himself in, with his political views and then everything sort of right. sprouted from there. Right. But it it's it's a it's he's not all that like in and of himself all that important. He's kind of represents an an idea that time has come as far as I'm concerned because like the main good arguments against traditional religion by the atheists are based in science and rationality. He counters all of them easily. <laughs> He's going up against Sam Harris, which is, you know, their biggest gun. 
and more or less held his own, if not completely won the debate. So, not without much. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And, and part of it is over the past, let's, let's say, 70 years, natural theology has atrophied in, in, in modern Christian culture. Um, right. and, and that's what partially it ends up confusing these young people, right? That they don't have a really good ground for the synthesis between rationality and science and natural revelation mm -hmm. and special right. revelation. And, and they basically get preyed upon by these people that, that are selling, a, selling snake oil, be it um, certain types of new age religions or atheism. Yeah. There's, de there's definitely truth in that, for sure. And the, uh, yeah, I mean, I agree. We're, we're, and there's, Peterson is kind of a turning of a new page that, you know, you can defend traditional Christian beliefs, even orthodox ones, using the tools of the educator, the scientists, and the sociologists, you know, really mm -hmm. easily. <laughs> that's, that's the thing that nobody really recognized. That's that's the part, you know, they're... they're that I see changing quickly. That's at least one part of why it's popular. But go ahead. You know who I went and saw recently was, and I'm looking in my the corner of my screen. I've got uh, something from Hugh Ross. Have you paid any attention to Hugh Ross? Because I think, and if we look at some of these scientists who are out there, and Hugh Ross is a um, astrophysicist, and he makes a really good case for God and Genesis based on what he sees in in the space. Um, and what he saw with the Big Bang and, and that kind of thing. So, um, so I think that some of these scientists, if they once they start really delving into this stuff, I think science can bring people right towards God too. I would agree. Yeah, definitely. Um, and, and, and I mean that that that's how we know God exists is through creation and the study of creation through science. Um, Eve just commented that natural theology is making a comeback in professional philosophy. The problem is that not that no one is doing it, but few are taking it seriously in the broader academic world. Um, I wanted to bring this up. Uh, yeah, that's a good this, point. I wanted to bring up this other book I have. It's, uh, it talks about natural theology or natural philosophy and Christian faith. It's right here. This is hopefully these books I'm mentioning are, are helping others. Oh, Nancy Piercy. I've, I've seen, I've seen her. I've got one of her books. She's, she's very good. Yeah, Nancy Piercy is a very good author. This is the soul of science and it, and it goes in to how science was developed. Yeah. How science came about. It came about by famous people like Isaac Newton and Kepler and, and Robert Boyle and the Boyle lectures and, and so forth. I could go on and on about all of this, but there is no dichotomy. Science, our modern understanding of science, at least from the, um, from the Enlightenment, that is a Christian, a, a Christian philosophical um, invention. I agree. I think you can make a strong case for that. Yeah, and I mean, well, well and this is sort of one of the issues uh, with really modern uh, philosophies of science is science is no longer about understanding what the essence of the world is or the natural world, right? That, that, that's what we think of as science sort of intuitively. But, but it's become atrophied such that scientists also now don't claim that their models say stuff about how the world really is, just that these models predict. And and the, the, the issue with that is, well, one, it sort of allows you to, to, to punt on metaphysical issues, right? But the, the other issue is it means that science is fundamentally a parlor game, that the theories you have are good at predicting, but they're not necessarily <laughs> Right. <laughs> oh, sorry. Hold on. I'm, I'm trying to mute. I'm trying to mute. Sorry. I'm trying to see if. There we go. And and that's sort of the issue is that by punting on these metaphysical questions, you end up with a science that 
that is disconnected from reality and is just another type of poetry in some sense, right? And not to, to degrade poetry. Poetry can have a lot of truth in it, but there are there, there are an unlimited number of poems you can do about a sunset, right? And the same is true of science that doesn't have like an Aristotelian or a theistic grounding is you're no longer talking about how reality really is. You're just sort of writing a description of it. Yeah, I think that's fair. Science is very descriptive and not prescriptive and talking about, we can talk about what is versus what ought to be and what ought to be can't be explained by science. Mm -hmm. We talk about morality. And I, yeah. you know, Eve made a pretty good point here. And I was just wanting to say um, with respect to academia, because I think that she's right as far as um, she says, academia, we need a few decades for academia to become friendly to atheists again. And I, and there is a, a bit of a leftist ideology spiral, she says. And so um, I can, I can say that it would be tough to be in the science departments these days in, in universities. I would say, I'm in business and I don't find that problem really at all, but I think that it is something that I see in sciences um, as far as, uh, um, I, I'll t give you an example. I went to a, a, was it a baseball game? Yeah, I went to a baseball game a few years back with my dean and three other deans in our colleges. And one of the deans kind of looked and he laughed uh, at the other two deans and he says, well, no one believes in God. And I thought, well, I do. Uh, I do. <laughs> and I looked at my dean and, you know, and I thought to myself, hmm, I wonder what he thinks. So then I decided I was going to take it upon myself to, to talk to him about this, <laughs> have a word. And he said, well, he absolutely believes in God, but he didn't stand up to the other dean and um, he didn't say anything. So we just kind of all grew silent, which was kind of a shame. But Yeah. And, and, and part of this, and it, I think it, it, at this point it, it, it's time has passed is um, once upon a time, and and, and I'll, I'll I'll give the charitable version is that in American culture we came we came here and were a bunch of different Christian sects, right? There were Quakers, there were Puritans, there were Anglicans, there were Baptists, there were Methodists, um, uh, Anabaptists, so on and so forth. And so one of the social protocols that we sort of developed is you don't talk about religion in public um, uh, or theology in public or things like that. And the, the, the issue now is the people that are willing to talk about it in public to some extent are atheists. Um, and, and it happens in, in England as well, where you know some atheists will claim that no one's religious at the office. Little do, does he realize that eighty percent of them go to church on a, a, a regular basis and, and, and do Bible study at home. Um, and th this is sort of my frustration with ideological atheism, where they they proselytize or they think that their frame is the secular frame and that any secular environment uh, belongs to them. But, but that's not really the case because the, the secular was invented by Christianity specifically uh, on the Sermon on the Mount by Jesus. And, and there, there, there are some analogies in Judaism that you can make, but the, the fundamentally that was the key thing that we have a, a separation between what is sacred and the secular. And that, that doesn't mean that the, the secular is without God. It just means it's for everyday use, basically. Yeah, I do think, would you guys, and I, I guess whoever wants to talk on this, but do you think that we're too politically correct? Because I think that has, I think political correctness is exactly what you're... you're oh, totally. Promoting. Totally. Politic, political correctness is poison. It's poison. It's it's totally. It's a way of shaming people into, you know. It started out with good intentions, but it's turned into something really, really, really bad. Um, the other thing I wanted to get back to, but uh, I don't really want to change from that yet. But he was talking about when I first got on obligatory morality. Um, so at some point we should get back because he was making Andrew was making some really good points on that that I wanted to talk about after we're done with this. But yeah, political correctness, poison. Josh, what do you think about political correctness? Well, um, it's a waste of time and, and um, it shows people 
uh, if I did that in, in my teaching, when I'm teaching world or, or the U.S. history, I'm a high school teacher, um, that would not be taking history seriously. As a teacher, I have a responsibility to my students and myself to talk about these, these issues like slavery or the American founders or, um, you know, what the Bill of Rights was was based on when, when Thomas Jefferson wrote it. Um, it. It was based on natural uh, theology, natural philosophy, uh, in these inalienable rights. Um, so I, I don't really care about um, you know, this, this understanding of, you know, political, um, I'm sorry, what, what is it called again? Political correctness? Yeah, it's, not, it's the I'm idea, not... well, people don't want to talk about religion, they don't want to talk about, uh, you don't talk about religion, politics, you know how that works, and so. Well, yeah, I, I, as a teacher, there's no way I can do that. Um, it's, it's impossible to be an intellectually honest teacher. And again, I have a responsibility to myself, to the historical process, and to God. No matter what you know, silly postmodernist arguments there are for political correctness, I, I don't follow those laws. I, I follow a, a law that's above that. So the, uh, the, the way that I look at it is political correctness is a combination of two things, right? So. One thing that, that that we always do in our culture is the type of language we use to describe sacred things is sort of set aside, right? The, this, the, the, the legitimate case of this is things like taking the Lord's name in vain, uh, swearing, things like that. We, we don't use like the name of Christ in a profane way. And by profane, I mean secular way. We don't do, uh, do it disrespectfully. And part of the issue with the political correctness is that it's basically taking these rules that we've set aside for the most sacred things, like, like religious truths, and they're applying them to political opinions or tribal opinions. And, That's and, a great point. Yeah. And, and basically what this ends up doing is, is you end up basically being condemned for blasphemy because you aren't following the right trend. Um, and, and then the other issue is, and honestly, I, I, I have no issue with being polite, right? I'm an Anglican and, and we're polite to a fault. Um, and it's sort of a conflation of you're not allowed to talk badly about these ideas because it's impolite, and oh, we mustn't be impolite. And and that that that's that's the thing is is I can talk about really controversial or or let's call it dangerous subjects, but still be very polite and respectful to the person, right? I, I can have a respectful and polite conversation with, uh, for example, a, a Muslim who thinks that non-Muslims go to hell. Even though that's going to be a very intense conversation, I can definitely be polite and say that this is why you're wrong and so on and so forth. And and so basically that's sort of the, the issue is that it's a twisting of, uh, potentially a twisting of language to enforce a way of thinking rather than having this shared, shared like, um, context of like we're all americans and therefore all americans treat all other americans with respect right or all citizens or, or all people with respect and here are the rules for politeness in our society that we follow and it's altering those rules to change how the discussion happens right he's it started out with the good intention of or there are there are undergirdings of good intentions. You know, you should speak respectfully about other cultures and other types of people, and you should try to address them respectfully. That's valid. But it turned into a way of shaming people out of even, you know, opinions that may be true that you just can't, you're not allowed to say because it's not politically correct. And you're not allowed to speak publicly about some things you know, that that's starting to become a device for shaming certain types of people from basically even perceiving truths, ne never mind publicly addressing them. You know, some truths are uncomfortable. 
and you've got to just talk openly about them. You know, it's just no way around it. You want to be as diplomatic as possible. Sure. But that doesn't mean that you, you know, it's turned into something really, really, really toxic. And the people who are using it most effectively understand it as a tool of social control. That's how they're using it. That's what I think. I mean, they yeah. know. They're not yeah. stupid. Uh, yeah, I think you're dead on. Um, a great example of this is James Damore, right? The guy who was at Google, and and he he was forced to go to, to diversity training, and they said, okay, well, give us some feedback. And like a good in, little engineer, he's like, oh, well, I'm going to research this and come up with potential reasons why you know there's a um, a difference in the number of male and female engineers at Google, and basically he wasn't. He was he wasn't attacked because he was wrong. He was attacked because he didn't support the the, the less, dogma. Yeah, the dogma. The dogma. Right? Just yeah. call it what it is. The underlying PC dogma. He he broke ranks with the with the propaganda machine and they kicked him. They fired him, right? Didn't he get yeah. fired? Yeah. That's got, insane. That's yeah, insane. You know, and it's it's a, there's a self-selection thing, and if any, as a female, and I'm the only female here in this crew, I'll put, I'll give you another example that I saw with Jordan Peterson. Uh, he put a tweet out that was connecting to a research article that was withdrawn, and the article basically proved that women and men have differences in intelligence, and it actually showed that men have more variation. So they're they're more likely to be on the upper end or the bottom end of the scale, whereas women hang more in the middle. Uh, it, it just tends to be how it is. It's the truth. I mean, I would prefer that the truth come out rather than people. People try to hide that. Yeah, some exactly. of us have this. Some of us are the same in the same man. <laughs> We're the dumbest and the smartest at the same exact time. That's my wife. That's my wife. She'll tell you. <laughs> She's yeah. at, at root, I'm an oaf. <laughs> you know. So, but anyways, go ahead. Sorry. Milton Friedman, the uh, Nobel Prize winner in economics, I think I believe it was 1974. He said the ro uh, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Uh, and I totally. Think we, yeah, I think we, the postmodernist um, crowd really needs to remember this. Look, you, you claim to be, uh, a person can claim to be a postmodernist, but when they're looking at, let's say, a medicine bottle or a stop sign, well, all of a sudden they're a realist. Um, again, it goes down back to that philosophy. Can we trust our senses and our cognitive abilities? Um, there, I don't think there are any real um, postmodernists. They they claim to be. There, there's no real atheists. They claim to be, but they live in a, in a theistic mindset in how they interact with others and what they believe in their subconscious. So, so yes. I'm just gonna uh, read another comment from Eve that I think is is dead on. Uh, everyone has an understanding of the sacred, but if you don't hold sacred things as sacred, you will s hold certain profane things to be sacred and will be rad radically disoriented. Mm. Eve has some good opinion. You know, Eve's a good example of someone I'd love to have come in here and chat with us because she's got such good opinions on, on a lot of topics and she's so uh, sophisticated and she's very good in philosophy. And so thank you for being in the chat. The sad thing is, is that one of the reasons why she doesn't come in is because she's uh, fearful of her university and what uh, right. backlash she might she receive. can't, because she can't. Think about how messed up that actually is. Because logically speaking, she can't because, you know, the opinions, the opinions that she would express Somebody would go, look, she's saying this on YouTube. Get her out of here. And people would agree to that. Well, that's they tried how to get crazy fire. this Right, yeah. but that's how crazy this has gotten. You know, that's how insane. There was a guy in Google who went to the Kavanaugh, who was a friend of Kavanaugh, who went there to support him. Whether you think Kavanaugh should be on the court or not, he was, his friend went there to support him. They were really discussing whether they should fire him for having a, a political opinion outside of work. That differs with standard Google. I mean, that's crazy. That's madness. And that's madness that'll consume both the right and the left. The, you know, the left just doesn't see that. They're, they're, the gun will be pointed at them at one point, and they'll be the ones running for cover. You know, it always works like that. So I think it's madness. 
there isn't there isn't a book that's coming out that's talking about our, our young people that are being indoctrinating uh, indoctrinated in this type of you know wussification this culture of <laughs> wussification <laughs> do you use that word in class i love that word i'm going to use that every day now <laughs> yeah well it is a wussification of our culture it totally it's called, is uh, it's called the coddling of the american mind by jonathan Hyde. Uh oh, sure oh yeah 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 know. yeah i know sure there's, there's oh, go ahead listing it's by jonathan Hyde, the coddling of the american mind where you have this generation starting pro probably it started in about 2013 2014 i think i believe that's what i said where you have you you needed colleges or some of these ivy league institutions needing safe spaces if a person was offended by a conservative speaker or they needed to see a counselor it, it goes back to the parent, the changing in parenting, starting in the in the late seventies and eighties, where parents did not let their kids and, and boys and girls play unsupervised. But there there was a scare mania, and everybody believed that the kids had to be supervised and had to be be coddled. And now we have a whole evolution since then, where we're bringing up wimps that aren't like you know we grew up that this this more of this rugged individualism it's now today it's a, like i'll say it again it's the wussification of of america yeah um and, and the, 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 the nassim taleb who, who's a great writer um and well uh, pardon me a great philosopher and talks about how certain things are fragile right like if you have a crystal goblet and you drop it like even a foot it'll break um, but other things are anti-fragile that they actually need um, to be shaken and 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 have stress imparted on them to grow and people and children especially are anti-fragile so the more you coddle them the weaker you make them uh, as opposed to like you know exposing them to rough and tumble play or, or ideas they don't understand and and all these things that 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 they need to be exposed to 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 learn and get better at yeah totally yeah i agree um i, I have a question for you guys how much how much longer did you want to chat because i i have uh brian stevens wants to get in the chat but i also think that we could also do another chat at another time with brian if, if we don't have much time left what time is? I have no idea what time it is. It's three forty-eight my time, so it must be twelve forty-eight your time. I think you're three hours behind. Um, yeah, I, I'm trying to see. I probably don't have that much time left because the the battery will die soon. I can go for another forty minutes. What do you think? Uh, what are you looking at, Andrew? Um, uh, I've got. Uh, I got sort of, about fifteen minutes. Uh, I can go for for as long as uh, as everyone else can. So, uh, whatever is a good fit for everyone else. Maybe we'll. Uh, we'll <laughs> Brian wants to get in here. He sent me an email. It says, "Is is uh, are you guys okay with with bringing one more person in?" Uh, sure, as long as we all get to make fun of him. <laughs> Brian, are you sure you want to come in? This is like the den of uh, lions because we're all standing on one side. So we'll have a, let me just see if I can find. Um, I want to bring something up before we uh, go into any other conversation. Uh, and this is for the audience uh, specifically, I think. Um, this dichotomy between science and religion, is specifically Christianity. Well, it was in the 1870s, 1880s around there by an author named Andrew Dickens, uh, Dixon White. And he, he wrote a book, it was called A History of the Warfare of Science and Theology. That book has been universally rejected, uh, critiqued, it, but it gave that facade, that uh, false impression uh, that there was a dichotomy, that there was a necessary warfare between science and religion. But please don't forget this name, Andrew Dickinson White and his um, 
is uh, atheistic apologetic uh, called A History of the Warfare of Science and Theology uh, with Theology, which has been universally discredited. Very interesting. I hear, I'm trying to figure out, Craig, I think you might have some background noise going on. Yeah, okay. Um, I might, this is probably, I'll probably go blank pretty soon because I have about five minutes left on my phone and then I'll, then I'll just be out. Can, is there still background noise? Oh, I, I, you sound pretty good now. Okay. We've got, we've got Brian Stevens who just added himself in here. Hi, Brian. Hey, everyone. I'll, I'll, I'll hello, be hello. nice. And, and as long as you're nice to me. <laughs> <laughs> we'll all be nice. It's, we're, we're a nice group. <laughs> No, I, I will say this. Um, I do appreciate SJ. I disagree with you a lot, but you're usually open to conversation. You know, everyone gets mad at each other, but you you have conversations with people, and I appreciate that. Oh, thank you. Yeah, that's good. So did you, did you want to offer your opinion on any of the topics that we've talked about? Do you think we're too politically correct these days? <laughs> um, I do think, you know, you know who I really like? I really like Bill Maher. He's what I consider yeah. kind of a classical liberal. I mean, there's so many shapes of liberals and conservatives these days that you can't just say liberal and know who everyone's is. And Bill Maher is not politically correct, i.e. the show. And um, you know, he'll ruffle some feathers. He'll say things I disagree with. But all in all, I know he has good intentions and we probably disagree. We probably agree on policy issues. Yeah, I like I, I, I like Bill Maher, actually. He's got a funny sense of humor. Hey. <laughs> I didn't know if you guys had questions for me, but I can tell you whatever I think or you guys can ask me. Whoops, Craig, you got Craig. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> sorry Craig. Craig's outside sorry. in California. If we could see Craig's view right now, it's probably looking quite lovely. I'm sure you're near the ocean and we're probably right on the beach, right there, Craig? Yeah, I'm right. I'm looking at the, the mountains on one side and the ocean on the other. It's the only place in the world outside of south of France that that happens, where the mountains meet the ocean. I'm pretty sure those are the only two places, Malibu and uh, Nice. Wow. And they're both. Yeah, it's pretty. It's pretty cool because the, the mountains are like right at the water, right at the right at the beach. Is that's, that better? That is neat. Yeah, that sounds pretty good. All right. Mediterranean climate. <laughs> yeah, um, Mars interesting because I mean, and this is sort of one of the frustrations I have with uh, the, the 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 discourse in American culture is we end up having people that are comedians who will make points but then sort of slide into being a comedian when they're the, were pressed on it right so and and that's sort of the issue with with john stewart and bill maher and some of these others is that they like to play the fool and criticize be, uh, but they're in a position such that their critiques can't be critiqued without being, you know, getting a pie in the face uh, to the people critiquing them. And, you know, uh, I have no issue with comedians, and I think that uh, uh, free speech is a very, is a good, a natural good, um, that that's really important. But but the, the, the frustration I have is that in our society, we don't seem to use it for the type of discourse to find truth as much as we should. And, and I think it's interesting. I have heard people, I think John Stewart one time said that he was on Crossfire with Tucker Carlson, my God, over a decade ago. Say, so, oh, I just said God, so you got me now. But, um, you know, he said, you know, I'm on after a show of, about puppets that make prank phone calls as to belittle any critique of himself. And I do think they should be open to critique. Um, I do think their primary objective is to be funny. So, um, but it's hard. We, we've reached this new boundary with things like The Daily Show and the Half Hour News Hour, which was a very bad Fox News attempt at The Daily Show. But we've reached this new boundary of uh, political comedy that, um, I don't know, it has a different, I think it should have a different critique, but it should be open to critique. And um, we should realize that some of these people, Mar is m more educated in these things, but some of these individuals who do political commentary are probably not the most educated. I, I hopefully can think of an example to show that to be true, but they don't have to be. They can just make the jokes. Yeah. The and, other thing uh, with... Go ahead, Craig. Uh, the other thing with Mar, um, this is back to the original thing we were talking about, is he's a perfect example of 
I like Bill Maher a lot. I watch that show almost every week, just about, or at least half of it every week. Um, but he gets in trouble with the PC police almost every other week. And for example, when Sam Harris was on, they were critical of Islam. They were, the people actually went after them. You can't be critical of Islam because that's racist. And that was the premise of the critique. Oh God, here we go again, sorry. Is that too loud? Can you hear that? Um, that was the premise of the critique. You cannot be critical of Islam because that is ra racism, period. And yeah. you know, that's their talk. There's, there's now like standard group think that you're not allowed to step outside, even if you're Bill Maher. So that's all I want to say on that. And, and I think that's an important point is that, and we'll see, right? I mean, in some ways we see on sort of the edges of, of the red tribe, let's call it, and the blue tribe in America, that, that people get such a strong sense of in-group versus out-group between the red and blue tribe that they actually mm -hmm. are basically either engaging in a cold war or sometimes when, when they're un mentally unstable, uh, a hot war between these two tribes in America. And, and it's really sort of disconcerting and, and worrying to me because the, 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 the entire point of a nation is to have a higher shared identity that allows you to organize yourselves and negotiate things, right? So that red tribe versus blue tribe is not like, you know, tribal warfare, but it's like, okay, the family's going out to dinner, who wants tacos and who wants hamburgers? And then to sort of reduce the, uh, the amount of conflict, right? because we're supposed to have a shared identity and a shared national way of doing things. And, you know, there's some disagreement that that's possible, right? I mean, the Amish have a very different way of doing things than uh, like a traditional Anglican, right? A traditional Anglican accepts technology and, and engages in all these things and the Amish don't. But there's also this higher level understanding that we have that like the Amish have to go to school for like the first six grade grades, right? They they don't have to do selective service, but they also, uh, you know, aren't politically active and all of these things that are explicit and implicit that allow for that diversity to exist in a way that doesn't harm the values that we uh, share and consider the highest. Yeah, I think I, I, I want to I'm going to piggyback on some of the things that you guys have, have all said and kind of bring this together. One of the things with the red and the blue tribe that I think is kind of interesting is what happened with Brett Kavanaugh and Christine Blasey Ford, because here we had Brett Kavanaugh. I, I initially watched that and initially thought that Christine was um, genuine. I think she gen genuinely had an experience. Uh, but then I listened to Brett and I kind of found myself saying, well, wait a minute, what about his side? And so I was looking at both sides, but so many people basically picked one or the other purely because of their politics. And there's something that really disturbs me about the whole thing. It came out, um, I think it was a Washington Post article said that they, the Senate Judicial Committee, the Republicans on it, knew of two men, had spoken to two men who said they were the men in the story. And um, the Washington Post article, you can now only fact find with the Wayback Machine. I don't know if they took it down for whatever reasons, but I really want to know, I almost feel like we should know, since this was a very public process, who these two men were who supposedly were spoken to. And I, here's, here's what I don't like about the process. I like transparency. I feel like the whole thing wasn't transparent. And I, if the FBI did not speak to those two men who supposedly, and all I can do is say supposedly, because I can show you the Washington Post article exists, which means supposedly these two men exist. And now I want to know, did the FBI speak to them? And if the FBI didn't speak to those two men, then I'm like, what are we, I mean, like, I could do a better investigation than this. Than this. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it, the whole thing is a mess. That is, I, I think that exemplified some of the mess that we see out there right now. And I think Fox News has done a terrible, dis, dis, you know, it's, it's. I, I would say that they've done a big job in wedging, uh, putting a wedge between the blue and the red. Look at how much we agree on. 
<laughs> yeah. I don't know if Andrew will agree on that, though, because I know Andrew leans to the right. I oh. tend to lean a little to the left. <laughs> oh, well, I want us to be ruled by a monarch, so I'm... <laughs> 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 Uh, and uh, I'm far right, even for for Red Tribe. I have more sympathy for the Red Tribe, but but I'm a monarchist orange. Uh, Can you make a strong argument for why we should be ruled by a monarch? I mean, I would, I want us to be a little more socialist, so we can well, just. Well, well, I tend to be uh, a distributist economically, um, which, which in some sense is Christian socialism. Um, but fundamentally, the, the, uh, here's the argument. Uh, democ direct democracy never works at scale. You can have a de democratic system if you have about 200 people or less. Um, above that, you need either some representative system or some hierarchy uh, to determine what, what occurs, right? And so the, the, the two ways to do that is basically either some form of aristocracy where you have people who are trained from birth with an understanding of what their obligations are and, and the virtues necessary to rule, or you have everyone be virtuous, right? So. Uh, and Aristotle makes a pretty compelling st uh, case of this, that the best system for a society where everyone is virtuous in the classical sense of having wisdom, justice, um, temperance, and courage is actually some form of republic where you select a subset to represent the, uh, the, the society in governance. The issue we have is Basically, we're no longer at the point where we have sufficient virtue in the populace to be an effective republic. And so we've been sort of gotten to the point where all we can do is do faction. And so there are two ways to solve this, right? One is to get everyone to be virtuous again, right? But, but that's a fundamentally difficult thing to do because we don't really know how virtue is cultivated in a culture. We know how it's done in a family and we know how to encourage that in individually, but, but it, it's sort of, you know, we need divine grace for that. Or we select people who do have these virtues and, and have them rule us, basically. Um, and so that's my 30 second or three minute or whatever uh, uh, summary of why monarchy is the best policy for America. Can but, I, can I uh, support that argument? Um, Hans Hernet, Hernan Hoppe in this book, uh, this is democracy, the God that failed this radical um, individualism, this radical democracy, democratization. He has argued uh, that monarchy is is superior than this form of direct democracy that the Greeks had, where um, you know you could you could even vote for for the death of Socrates. Um, he also I'm, makes, makes I'm just going to pull out a math book. That's what I'm going to do. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. He also makes his case in the theory of socialism and and capitalism. This is a very famous book. He used to teach at UNLV. He's a, an economist uh, from the Austrian school. And, and please, if you're watching this, Hans Hernan Hoppe, he's from Germany. That's why uh, his, his name is uh, very unique. Okay. So do you think that uh, the electoral college system is a good system? Oh, yeah. I think we should um, go back to having states elect senators directly uh, as well. Um, I also, th well, the, 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 the fundamental issue with the electoral college or our system is um, the Supreme Court decisions uh, affect every state in the nation. Um, if we had a way to limit the, the power of the Supreme Court so that we had more of a federation, that would also mitigate some of the, the issues we're having with faction now, right? Because fundamentally, at this point, the Supreme Court isn't the, the last court in the land. The Supreme Court is like a super legislator, basically. Um, and I think that can be reasonably made, whether you lean blue or red, that, that the Supreme Court can, does de facto have the ability to legislate from the, from the bench. 
I want to ask something about the Electoral College real briefly. Um, some states have done stuff like this. Do you think it's better or worse that the Electoral College is an all or nothing? Or what I would prefer, we just go by the percentages and then whoever gets X percentage, we divide the vote up via the state that way. Then it's basically an aggregate vote that has control via the Electoral College. Um, I think that's fundamental, fundamentally a decision on each state. Um, and and it, it depends on two factors. One is how variable the control of that state is, right? Um, and the other <laughs> is how, and how large it is, right? So um, I don't think it would make sense for like Wyoming to do that, right? Because Wyoming is small enough that its interests as a state uh, from the perspective of the federal government are aligned uh, but a state like California um, it has a lot of diversity in the the potential things that they need to do so it might make more sense for them to to split that up um, and, and so yeah uh, and th th this is sort of my crotchety monarchist talk that a uh, uh, proportional representation outside of the House of Representatives isn't necessarily a good thing. And so you have to make a stronger argument than just proportional is best. I could argue against that. I don't, I, if, I don't want to dominate the conversation, but I, I have a lot I disagree with. I'd actually like to see a, power, a popular vote. <laughs> so yes, I, yes. Uh, just, <laughs> just, just a bossy electoral college is nonsense. I, I don't like the Electoral College, that's why I brought it up, but I, I'm not well, going to dominate either. Well, 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 what do you think of minority rights? Well, uh, the, go ahead. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. No, you go ahead, Brian. Well, are you making the argument that the Electoral College defends minority rights when you go to the small states, which it still gives them a vote? Is that the argument, that Electoral College defends minority rights? No, no, I'm asking okay. you how, how you're going to defend minority rights if you have proportional representation. We defend minority rights with the Senate. The Senate, I think, is one of the best defenses of uh, minority rights when you look at the states. Now, of course, we have major issues that everyone in the state is not represented by just two people. So we got to figure out how better to not have all lawyers in Congress and in Senate. Well, Congress, we'll just call it Congress. Not to have all lawyers and some doctors, but mainly lawyers. Um, we got to figure out a better way to get people in there. I want truck drivers. I want teachers. I want people who have been homeless. I want people who understand life in America so they can legislate towards life in America. Now they need to be educated and they need to have an understanding of how to be a legislature. But um, right now we're just ran by lawyers and a bunch of rich people who have friends. So, or the friends of rich people. So right now we're not well represented. And I think we take care of minority representation for, from the state's perspective via Senate. I think that does a fine job at that. Okay, uh, so uh, I guess the uh, uh, SJ, do you have anything to add to that? No, I think that those are good points. Okay, so um, all right, so so I'll I'll, I'll do a little extreme. Uh, I think that if you're going to have representative government, that like you said, it needs to be more representative. Um, and so if I got to be king for the day and determine what the American system would be, one of the biggest changes I'd make is the House of Representatives. I would, instead of it being uh, voted by congressional district, I would make it uh, a, a majority in congressional district. I'd use a system called random ballot. So random ballot is everyone writes who they want the candidate to, uh, to win in. They put it in a giant, you know, uh, price is right thing. And they pick out who, who it is. And based on that, that's the person that ends up being the representative. So it's basically, um, uh, it has a very interesting uh, uh, property. If everyone votes for themselves, it becomes a jury duty. Um, but the, if someone is very popular, then they, they, it, it sort of ends up being like our current system, right? So let's say that there's a lot of trust into, uh, we'll pick the Green Party, right? The Green Party is really trusted in this part of America and the Green Party endorses this person. That person now gets a lot more votes because they have the party mechanism behind them. And so we have this sliding scale that can go from our current system to something that's selected by a lot. 
And in something like the House of Representatives, the this allows things to be averaged out, right? So there is a small chance that you'll end up with like a monarchist in your House of Representatives, right? But the House of Representatives is designed for for uh, detailing the, the 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 sort of flux of democracy. So I would agree with you that the House of Representatives is not democratic enough and it needs to actually have better representation from actual American citizens. What you just described is almost like a genetic algorithm as though through randomness, um, because the people who are most likely to win would be the ones getting the most votes, but the person who wins is random and anyone could win with just one vote for even themselves. So I, I like it and I don't like it. Um, it, it would be a very bad way to select the president. Yeah. <laughs> okay, let's <laughs> yeah. not use it for that. Yeah, yeah exactly. but, 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 but something like the House of Representatives, when, when you're dealing with the average or aggregate, I think it would work better. Um, and, and that's sort of the thing. The other thing that, that would have a very interesting effect is, let's say in America, pop, population-wise, it's like 45% red tribe, 55% blue tribe, something like that, right? Uh, of the voting populace, yes. Of, yeah, yeah. Of, of the voting populace. If that's the case, then on average, 55% of the time it would be dominated by blue tribe, and 45% of the time it would be dominated by red tribe. So this, and I'm not sure the sociological effects, but basically what this would mean is even if you have a one percent advantage in a district you that's not a guaranteed district or that's not guaranteed so you have to come to a system that allows everyone to be uh sort of happy with it because next time you're going to have to give the the, the keys over to the next party right and one of the problems in america uh, over the past let's say 20 years is that when one party had power over the two branches of legislative and executive, they took action to increase the power of the, the, the unilateral power of the executive. That happened with uh, W, that happened with Obama, and it seems to be happening with Trump as well. And the thing is, the, this seems to happen under the assumption that one party is going to rule forever. And so there's this whiplash and, and disconnect when the other party wins and now has all this additional power in the executive. Yeah, no, I, I agree with a lot of your last few statements right there. Um, I, I really think we've done a disservice to America by putting ourselves in this two-party format because it has become an us versus them mentality. If there were three, four viable parties, people would see, oh, there's no right and wrong side to an issue. There's just two people who disagree, and then we need to figure out, you know, which way is better, and then have some metric to gauge that. That's, you know, that that speaks to something that I would think about because I, when I say I lean to the left, I lean to the left on cer certain issues, and I lean to the right on other issues, and uh, it it just it's it's one of those things where neither party well explains my position at all, and so um, I, I would love to see some more parties. I, I would like to know if your position has evolved on the legalization of marijuana any. <laughs> oh, you watched me on that. <laughs> I don't want recreational marijuana legalized, no. I, I also I'm okay with medical marijuana. That, but I, I do not, I would not ever want to use marijuana. I just think we spend too much money in America policing it and dealing with the consequences of it. We could open that can of worms if people want, but um, I don't want it for personal usage. Um, yeah. I just I would just want my kids to get out of college and then then they can go ahead and legalize it after that after my kids have made it through college because they've shown if you know very young minds that that do use pot they've been adversely impacted their brain has been damaged if they start using pot at a very young age so I, I do want to see well one I believe we can't even do full studies on it right now because the way it's it's a class one drug is it and the way it's classified we can't even do full scientific research on it and so that should change right now right now we should just be like let them run the scientific studies. I'm sure a bunch of potheads would love to sign up to smoke weed and see what happens to them and get paid to smoke weed. Like, here, we're going to buy you food, we're going to give you money, and you get to smoke weed. They'd be like, sign me up. 
So this would be very easy research to do and do some brain scans, figure out what's going on. You know, we'd have to use people at maybe 18 because if we do legalize it, of course, we don't want children doing it. And of course, you should be pulled over and arrested. There's nothing that gets on my nerves more than when I see someone drive a car by and I smell a pot cloud of smoke coming out of the car. And I'm like, to me, that's people say it's less dangerous. I believe it's just as dangerous as drive, drinking and driving. So I hate it when people say it's less dangerous. If you're on drugs or even um, medication, watch out. You shouldn't be driving in a car under any sort of influence. Even tired can be an influence that you shouldn't be driving under. Oh, I agree. Yeah. So I don't know if people want to go to that can of worms, but that's how I feel. I, I think that, I, you know, from what I've seen with the research, it seems like a lot of people in the United States support the idea of medical marijuana because there are a lot of people who are helped by it. And I, I don't think that that's controversial. To me, it's the recreational marijuana that's controversial. We, um, I know someone who shattered their elbow, cracked it against a rock, and they're older, they're close to 70, and they had never, they're anti-drug, they don't drink or anything like that, but they were in so much pain, they couldn't sleep, and they said to me, they said, you know, I was thinking about smoking weed, because if I'm, if I'm running out of options, if I can't sleep, I'm feeling nauseous, because they were on, like, strong painkillers, and when I would talk to them on painkillers, they sounded like they were drugged, like they, I mean, what they were, I mean, it was scary, it was really scary hearing them on painkillers, um, they had forgotten talking to me and stuff. I, I've talked to potheads. I'd prefer them smoke pot than be on really heavy painkillers. If it's working, if it's working. What do you guys, Josh, what do you think about all this? Mm -hmm. You have spoken a little while. Well, I don't know if we should make a law for, uh, for individuals. We should make it for the general public. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm listening. I'm, I'm just, just listening. I, I agree with a lot you're, you're saying, Brian. I, I can say something with, with that the Highway Patrol has found, and, and I did when I did my little research, my, my, my little research on what's going on with pot. Um, people do drive slower when they're on pot than they do when they're on alcohol. They're, they tend to speed on alcohol, and they tend to drive slower on pot. Either way, they're impaired. So, you, you know, we could we could give people alcohol and put them in a uh, test drive car, not a real car, but like a simulated car, and then have them do like a driving simulation, and then get all the metrics. But um. I would like to know, so is it is your main reason against um, the use of marijuana by the general public, the, and I do realize that the brain develops well into the 20s, impulse control is one of the last things to be full, finalized in the brain. Is it just uh, brain development? Um, is that the key issue? No, the key issue is once you legalize something, it starts becoming more prevalent. And I, I just, I, you know, I don't think that it's a good idea to smoke pot. So I think that if you legalize it, it's kind of like there's another issue that people have been bringing up in some of these conversations is legalizing prostitution. I'm completely against that. I, I see no reason to legalize prostitution because, again, that'll just open up more houses of uh, prostitutes. And, and I don't think that that's a good way for society to move. Oh, and and and. and just riffing on that, uh, one of the problems we have in our society, um, and, and this should be especially of concern of you if you're a classical liberal or libertarian, is that the only mechanism of universal morality we have in America is actually the law. That that's the only thing everyone will agree on what is moral and immoral, right? And and that that's part of the reason why we have so much conflict in faction. It's not like uh, let, let's pretend for a second that that I snap my fingers and and um, it's a traditionalist Anglican monarchy, right? Then you would have this institution, specifically the church, who would be able to say like don't uh don't use marijuana recreationally that's bad and it would have the moral authority to do that but then the laws could be made on utilitarian grounds on whether or not we should effectively enforce it and so on and so forth um and, and this is one of the things that that's especially lacking in the american system is we don't have any system that's autonomous to the law that everyone agrees on the authority to and I think you, you said we all agree the law is moral to some extent. And I, I wouldn't agree that law equates to morality. Law only legate, um, relates to legality, which obviously we have to follow legality. So I don't believe like some states have laws where you can't buy alcohol on Sunday. That's absurd. It's just a day. Today is just a day. I mean, I know it means a lot to a lot of people, but it's a day. And to tell a business they can't sell something because it's a certain day, I think is absurd. And so I'm... 
I am a bit of a libertarian, I would think. You can try to tell me I'm not in some ways. But um, to me, I want to going back to the pot argument, I realize more people might use it if it's legal. And I'm okay with that. To me, that's a personal choice they are making. Whether it has good or bad consequences on their life um, is not my place to control their life and to create a nanny state. So, no, little... so, so let's stop it right there. Sure. The, if we agree that it's not your responsibility, but is there a responsible way to use pot and not responsible, irresponsible way to use pot? Oh, yeah. You can look at um, Michael Phelps, Olympic athlete, top shape of his life was smoking pot. Um, you can look at um, who's the famous uh, physics guy. Sure, um, sure. So so the, the question is, how do we cultivate this ability to use it ethically in people if, sure. you're, not, if you're not going to teach them through the law? What mechanism are we going to use? Um, it's We don't need programs like D.A.R.E. that told me when I was a child that all drugs are bad, okay? So um, <laughs> that's literally what they were telling us almost. But what we need to show well, people... Well, that would fundamentally be the law again because it's a government system, right? Well, I believe if we... I think we should de decriminalize most drugs and talk about rehabilitation and um, stuff like that for people. People should be rehabilitated who are on drugs, not incarcerated where they become career criminals. That's, that's so, not the issue we're talking yeah. about. We're talking yeah, about how, yeah, how, how are we going to teach people that there are dangerous ways to use marijuana as a culture, sure. as a society? How are we going to do that? Oh, I, I, I think I have, I'd probably throw you a few ideas. Are you ready? One, if somebody is caught um, doing something like driving under the influence of marijuana, um, which we need probably better ways to test for, I think they should have their license suspended for two years. So, so that's using the law to to teach morality. Oh, and I'm good with. Well, the thing is, I don't think smoking pot is illegal. I think endangering the lives of others is illegal. So it's not the act of smoking pot. Uh, but um, but we're we're discussing not legality, but how to teach people th that there are responsible ways to use it and cultivate that moral behavior. Yeah, and, and you, I just, think you just gave a legal way to do that. Is there any yeah. way that you can do that without laws? Sure. I think we could do it without laws by showing people as adults, like as we raise children, um, showing our children. One, when I was growing up, um, my parents would let me have wine coolers growing up. I know like, that's probably why I still like them today. Um, so when I grew older, alcohol wasn't this taboo thing. So I think we as a society need to change our view that this is a really, really, you know, thing we can't do. But if you explain to children, say, here's why you shouldn't be smoking it. You shouldn't be smoking it because as your brain develops, it's going to cause problems. We, we've looked into this. So when you're later in life, you can make this decision. Um, you know, you will be in trouble with me. You can let the parent be the one who parents their child and put the responsibility on the parent to choose the consequences. And some parents will not raise their children correctly. Some will, or what we so, define as correctly. So, so okay, the, then we're going to ask this. Sure. How are we going to, as a society, enforce that children listen to their parents? Yeah, no, that's, um, oh gosh, if you wanted to talk to me about how we need to parent, parent well, I'm not a parent, so I probably shouldn't be the one going on about this. But I, I do, you know, I have read a good bit about this with my background. Um, how do we do that? Well, one, um, the education system just needs to be way better. Okay, we're well, now we're back to laws. So, well, yes, it is government, but that's government is just a bunch of people together. That's all government is is a bunch of people. We don't have to do it through laws. You know, the education system isn't laws. It's going to be funded by bills and um, by external sources like the gate. Fundamentally. Yeah the the education system is laws because it's a government function and government functions are through laws i would say you are correct it's it's built upon laws it's i would say i wouldn't say fundamentally it's laws i would say it's it's it has a foundation of laws which i guess is fundamentally so we have right. some so, so 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 we have an issue here because you sure, said that earlier that it's not the government's responsibility to teach uh, you know teach people morality in this way but mm -hmm. then you just articulated a system that uses laws to teach people this yeah so, but so i'm a little confused on yeah. on how this matches with your initial premise that, well, that that it's not a responsibility to to legislate these things well my only my only areas of legislation through the government regarding marijuana would be in the instances where it endangers the lives of others 
other than the person making the choice. In that instance, I do not believe we're legislating morality. I believe we are legislating safety. So I will give up some of my freedom, my freedom to drive a car under the influence, to have the safety from other people who are driving the car under the influence. So if you, I do not believe I would say that's legislating morality. I would say uh, that's legislating uh, safety. That That is. But then you said mm -hmm. that the way that we encourage people not to use marijuana irresponsibly, such as like being stoned all the time and, and not being as effective at benefiting society, was through through the school system. Is that well, no, correct? No, my, or my did I misinterpret response, that? My first response wasn't school. My first response was parents. Right, but then the question is, how do we uh, enforce that or make that a cultural norm? And well, then I mean, that's, that's, that's the tough system. question. You can't control parents. Um, you don't have to tell people, you know, they have to think a certain way. But I think if we let parents parent and we give parents the tools, um, it's tough. I think at some point you have to have a government in the background somewhere, and you can reach down deeper and deeper till you'll see a government behind it. But I think parents is the the answer I'd go with. Sorry, I've been talking a lot. As a, as a teacher, how in the world are parents going to get the tools to do this? Because all of the teachers at every school I've ever taught at know that they're having parents that aren't teaching them virtue. So where are parents going to get this other than from society and from, from law? I guess that's to me. And I think that's the issue. Um, and I'll, I'm going to answer by giving something to start and then I'm going to go back to it. Because have you ever seen the video by um, Boy in a Band? He's got the really, really long hair, much longer than mine. He's got red and black hair. It's called um, Don't Go to School. I think it's called, um, or um, no, it's called something like Don't Go to School or Don't Be in School. And he's talking about how the education system is failing us and how kids don't know how to do taxes. They don't know like CPR. They don't know basic, you know, health. They don't know about STDs, um, like other than STDs are bad, but they don't know proper condom usage. You look at all these things people don't know with a high school education. So I think we've created failing parents that create failing children. And then when we have to help the, the children, we go to the parent and the parent is unable to help the child. Like you're saying, it's very hard. So I think we need to unwork some of these issues with the children to then the children who next generation raise the next children. So our, literally the children are the future. I'm just quoting music now. But um, we have to help the children become better parents. And I'd then like their parents become raise better children. Uh, yeah, and as, as a college educator, one of the big trends that I've been seeing, and I think this is piggybacking on what you're saying, is, is, is very unfortunate, is we see a lot of helicopter parents. And, and I've had situations in which um, MBA students who are failing in the MBA program, their parents show up and, you know, would basically try to argue why their son or daughter should be in the program and, and what am I doing wrong and, and that kind of thing. And I think, well, you know, this, this clearly is, is, is a problem that's been going on for a very long time. We have a culture of entitlement. Uh, with the kids. And one of the things that, that's happened there is every kid's getting a trophy. So the kids are in sports and they all, you know, the entire team gets a trophy and, and it's just become something that um, has bred kids that, that unfortunately, you know, through no fault of their own, have these issues that they have to deal with. I, I think, I think and, we, go uh, ahead. So, and, and just sort of touching on this and, and Eve's been uh, chat, uh, chatting and, and I'll try to sort of summarize is this is sort of the issue, right? That you can't both want the government to leave people alone to the maximum extent possible so that you only legislate like safety and have the culture through, through a purely secular culture infuse, infuse people with virtue. Uh, that the way out of this fundamentally is you have to have s other mechanisms in the society to cultivate traditional values and virtue, which is what organized religion provides. And and this is this is this is basically the 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 thing, right? And this is the fundamental difference between like a virtual libertarian and uh, a more mainstream libertarian. And and you're exactly right, SJ, that basically what's happening is we 
we no longer look at education as something to instill virtue in the student or and excellence in a multitude of ways. Instead, it ends up being about the grade or the trophy or the external trappings of it rather than the, the, the actual training that, that, that ends up occurring. That's fair. I think, um, you know, it's thrown out that religion is one of those ways to instill morality. And I think maybe just social groups. A religion to me is a social group. And I think social groups keep people in line because there's uh, norms in the social group. And if you go outside those norms, you are either kicked out of the social group or chastised for that. So we do need social groups, but I'm not sure if well, we need religion. Uh, well, but that's the thing, though. Religion doesn't do that. Doesn't do what? Doesn't the, do what? Uh, religion isn't a social group in that sense. The norms of the religion and the norms of the social group are different. Two great examples of this are St. Francis and St. Stephen Damien, both of which were reformers of the church and specifically it went against the norms of the religious culture that they were in. And that's the fundamental thing, is that the religion is more than a social group. It is a transcendent hierarchy of values that people are associating with. And it's not based in the human social group, but something transcendent to human social groups. I, I, well, two things. One, I really want to know what is transcendent to human social groups. And two, Martin Luther went against the church, and that didn't go so well for him with the church. They, they were not happy about that. Yeah, I mean, you have to, you can stretch it. It's like a rubber band. You can pull it a bit. You can go outside, but once you go too far, everything breaks and they're like, gotta go. But, but that's the thing is that's not, that, that's, the, there are specific dogmas articulated by the church. And that's what differs someone who's a reformer from a heretic, right? So, for example, Stephen Damien basically engaged in a very corrupt church that, that has similarity to what we have today, in that there was rampant pedestry, there, there were, were cover ups, there were all these other things that were normative in the culture. You would not be kicked out if you did these things. But he went against that. And what he didn't, he didn't appeal to his own authority, he appealed to the authority of the religion. And that's what it means to be transcended from the social group, right? It wasn't because of the agreement of the social group, it was this transcendent tradition that had been revealed over time that was beyond any individual or even in the social group that he could appeal to as the truth. I feel like tradition is a very bad thing to appeal to because anything can be a tradition. So I don't see, I mean, traditions can be good or bad. So I don't think we should ever say the, the tradition of a religion transcends tradition just as it does. It does if you filter on survival. If the tradition gave... So, so this is the thing, right? If we assume, okay, so one of the assumptions is truth is robust. The longer something is around, assuming that it's in a environment that is hostile to it, if it survives, it is true. So it's more, it's more probable true. Sure, sure. The, the, the more like, likely it's either true or not true, um, more right, probable. Right, it's an inductive argument. You're right. So if we take an, an idea and it has stood the test of time, that is reasonably good evidence that it's true, right? I don't want to weigh judgment on that right yet. Um, I'll continue on with it. I just, I, I, need, you know, to think of, I need to think over that one more. There, there's, um, it, it doesn't necessarily, it could be true, but it doesn't mean it's necessarily right, put it that way. So, mm -hmm. so you could have an idea that, yeah. that's passed through, uh, but it doesn't necessarily make it right. In fact, there's lots of examples of cultures that have had bad ideas uh, that have somehow survived. Some of these bad ideas like cannibalism and that sort of thing. So, uh, well, 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 I'll make an a, a argument there, actually. Uh, are you talking about funeral cannibalism or like cannibalism of enemies? Um, just cannibalism in general, I think. Uh, so, 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 and and this is actually, ironically, one of the places where I tend to be more multicultural than than most Christians. Um, the the issue isn't that cannibalism is an innate evil; 
it's what respect is due to the body, right? So uh, to, to use an example, that there were two cultures in, in the ancient Near East, one who engaged in funerary cannibalism and one who didn't. And the, the question, if you both ask them, you know, do dead bodies deserve respect? They would both say yes. You don't desecrate a, a dead body. The question is, how do you do that, right? And that was culturally determined. In Rome, engaging in cannibalism was a desecration. While in in like parts of India, to not engage in cannibalism of your your dead relatives was a desecration. So some of these things are not necessarily morally good or bad, but but they persist because they 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 fit into a true hierarchy of values. Now and and to, to use an, another example of something that that doesn't vary among cultures, uh, murder or unlawful killing is universally condemned. Right, uh, and and the, the, the difference there is fundamentally like who belongs to the tribe. In Christianity, everyone belongs to the tribe in the sense of murder is uh, prohibited from everyone. But in like Papua New Guinea, literally the, the tribe is like 100 people and anyone out of the tribe you can kill uh, as an enemy combatant, basically. Interesting. Yeah, I, and I noticed Craig just jumped back in here. So hi, Craig. Hi, yeah, I, I walked home and plugged the phone back in. Here I don't know where we're at, though. What, what were we talking about? Uh, <laughs> we've been all over the place. It got, it got really weird. Everything, everything <laughs> yeah, I, I, I was listening to some of it on the way home. There are a couple of really cool points being made, but I don't know where you, what, what you want me to jump back in on. <laughs> I'm not sure where we're at now. I, I think that's really judgmental of you, Stephanie, that cannibalism is bad. I think that's judgmental. Um, <laughs> I thought that would be so uncontroversial, and it looks like it. No, it's not. It well, that's the cool thing about Andrew is that he, he comes in with like these, he can be really left field on like monarchy is, you know, he's a monarchist and like, so he can, he can like t surprise you with like, you know, you'll think something's straightforward and he'll come with a way out of the box opinion and then defend it. You're like, wait a minute, that actually makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> Cannibalism's Cattle, yeah. fine. Monarchy's good. Wait a minute, what's going on? Yeah. And then, as he's doing that, I'm trying to think in the back of my mind of other, you know, I'm thinking, okay, how about bestiality? Should I have said bestiality? <laughs> how can I find something that Andrew's not going to... Um, <laughs> I, I, the yeah. one, the one great point that Andrew made about, I don't know if you guys want to go back to this, but he, the, the reason why the Kavanaugh hearing was so heated is because we've been trying to legislate from the judiciary for since the 60s, basically. And we've given the Supreme Court way too much power that actually should be, you know, we should be deciding most of these questions by democracy, by convincing your fellow citizens on like gay marriage and things like that. But we've been doing it from the Supreme Court. And that's part of why it was so heated with Brett Kavanaugh outside of just the, the accusation itself. And he, he made that point that, it's be that. that he's become a super, that the Supreme Court has become a super legislature. Do you think, do you think people could have also been heated what happened with, um, is it Neil Gaiman? Um, that's the wrong, I don't know why that name's even in my head. That Neil Diamond? No, what not Neil is? Diamond. Um, <laughs> Who was the? He's Obama a local, actually. Cracklin Rosie. <laughs> no, wait, who? Neil Diamond, isn't that the Cracklin Rosie? No, um, yes. no. Who was the Obama appointee that they didn't even see? They, they're like, nope, too late in your term. Mer Merrick Garland. Merrick Garland. That's I don't know who. There's names in my head. Uh, Merrick Garland. Um, I think when you look at how that was handled, how he wasn't even considered, and then Kavanaugh is, of course maybe even to the right of Scalia. I don't know. Scalia was like states' rights until states' rights went against what he thought. I could show you examples of that. I'd have to go look at it again, but he would go against states' rights when it didn't. But um, at least to me, being more liberal, I felt like Merrick Garland should have had a fair shake and he wasn't well, given that's it. A, that's, a, that's a fair point. Merrick, mm -hmm. what, what, what McConnell did with Merrick Garland was definitely hardball politics. And controversial to be sure he said you know and it was it was a precedent established by democrats but it's certainly it, it, there's a certainly a fair debate that that is outside of fair politics that a, a, you know he's not even give merrick garland a hearing in the last year because there's a presidential election but so, all i was saying is the the heat now is that you know 
Brett Kavanaugh goes on the Supreme Court, and that's going to change the ideological composition of the court for the next 25 to 30 years and potentially overturn key, you know, like Roe versus Wade or are now potentially in jeopardy. And all I was saying is that the, the court has become, it's become too much of a referee, like what, what Andrew said, um, that it's too much of a super legislature. I'm not saying that, that you can't criticize the Republicans for hardball politics. You can't. Yeah. Um, well, you know. well, I think the court is a great thing in theory. I think we're reaching these problems now because in theory, the court is like the greatest legal minds who are who are on there for life, who don't have to worry about any, uh, pleasing anybody. Uh, John Roberts was appointed by Bush and uh, he still had chief justice, right? And uh, he's right. become a lot more uh, moderate liberal. And so I think he's he's the key example of what a justice should be, probably because he agrees right. with me. You but, just um, described uh, a monarchy. The people that are well educated. <laughs> Damn it. Exactly. Don't exactly. To, don't hey, have you guys, to worry about it, public opinion. It I'm makes a lot of time. sense. It makes think, more and more sense. The more well, he talks. What if we, Wait, we guys, I think let's, let's make some final points here. Uh, sure. just, uh, just to kind of wrap towards getting towards the end because we've gone pretty long today. So. So who wants to start? Well, I guess I'll throw some final points. I'll make them very brief. Thanks for having me in here. Um, if you ever want some contrary opinions, I'll throw them your way. And I think the great thing about America is how we have all these melding of different systems at different levels. And maybe that's why it works, because I love America. Thank I'm you. Bad. Who wants to go next? Sure. Um, oh, go, go ahead, Josh, while you go first. Well, we were talking kind of about civic virtue, and I pulled up this quote, quote by Alexis de Tocqueville, and he says, there is not a country in the world where the Christian re religion retains a greater influence over the soul of man than in America. We asked why there is a difference in, in, in the students nowadays. I keep asking educators from different schools. They say in the last 10 or 15 years, there's been a dramatic difference than even uh, when we went to school. Um, I think this is because we're getting away from what, where we came from, not just our immediate circumstances, but the context, and that includes philosophy and dare I say theology also. Um, we were built on a republic of virtue um, in, in our founder's conception. This goes back to Thomas Jefferson and John Lott. Uh, who, who presupposed natural rights. And I think if we're going to get our kids back, uh, our students back, maybe natural rights, natural law has something to say to it. That's fair. Craig or Andrew? Andrew, you want to? Sure. Um, I'll just uh, end this by saying that Christ is not only the tree of life of us as individuals, but he is also the tree of life of our civilization. Amen. Amen. Craig? My turn. Um, uh, yeah, this was a good conversation. Um, There's a lot of, lot of stuff brought to the table, and I'm now convinced that monarchy is the way to go. And if you disagree with what I said in this conversation, you more than likely hate America. So <laughs> just leave it with that. But by the way, let's think of like the Christian intellectual dark web discussion where we take on, uh, and I hope we do it in a more, um, you know, forceful way, um, take on some of these secular philosophies. Um, and I would love to, uh, you know, have this happen again, this discussion. Excellent. Well, I think we have a good crew here. If anyone um, is listening and would like to join us sometime, let me know. You can reach me at uh, LEAD1225 on Twitter, or you can reach me here on my channel. And would everyone like to say how we can reach you? <clears throat> yes, um, you can reach me on Twitter as Master Apologist. I also have a Patreon account, uh, Joshua J. Brister, and I would really appreciate your support. I thank you for listening. and. Uh, Hope to be here again next week or perhaps sometime soon. Sounds good. Um, yeah, I agree. This is a good group. Um, you can find me on Twitter at Craig Reed or um, th my channel is Craig Reed at the Christian Response. And Stephanie <clears throat> will post a link. <clears throat> <laughs> Sorry. I will post a link. Huh? I'll definitely post a link to your channel. <laughs> I've probably never given you one, I don't think. But yeah. I can um, I, I can find it. I'm subscriber 
to yours. So, Andrew, how can we reach you? Yes. Oh, yeah, sorry. Um, I'm Ace Fatalities on Twitter. Uh, I also occasionally blog on redpillreligion.com. Uh, that's where all our latest videos and articles are. Uh, we're sort of a confederation of different people that uh, do different uh, topics on religion, society, and politics. Um, but we have new content every day. That's redpillreligion.com. Excellent. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for coming here today. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and stop the broadcast. So. Yeah, cool.